date, finally, we have decided the target date for opening our beautiful building safely is November 15th. Some people thought that November 1st was too early, November 29th was too late, so we landed in the middle. This will give us time to get all the glitches out before we have an important Sunday. The sanctuary will be sanitized as will the Fellowship Hall for overflow. Plans are completed for broadcasting the service live to the Fellowship Hall. Chairs will be placed for social distancing and will be sanitized. We will continue, we will be continuing the pavilion services, well, a little chilly this morning for that, broadcasting to the parking lot and the live streaming. The parking lot broadcast will continue as long as it is deemed necessary, which means as long as there's somebody out in their car listening to the service, we will be broadcasting. The um, YouTube and Facebook live stream will continue indefinitely. And we will have a list of guidelines posted as well as in your newsletter. Please read them. There are some changes that will affect you Sunday mornings. But as long as we follow these guidelines, we can safely keep our building open. On behalf of the focus group, I thank you. Thanks. you uh, please join me in uh, uh, prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day today. We open our hearts to you, and we worship you here in your house. Hopefully we'll be in soon, Lord, but we are here worshiping, worshiping you today. Please guide us, Lord, and protect us, Lord, from this COVID. It has been spiking again, Lord, and we just urge people to do the next right thing. Just wear your mask. You know, Hopefully one day we will be able to worship in our house, the house of God. And all we pray, amen. And now we have special music.
Good morning, Calvary Baptist. Good morning. Um, as we come to our time of prayer, there are several on our prayer list, and you may have some in your heart that you carry with you. We ask prayers for Sharon, who continues to battle breast cancer, for Tegan, and for Artie Magruder. Also, I would ask prayers for a family who were members of a church of ours in Connecticut. They went to Arizona to celebrate their anniversary, came back with the virus, and he has since died. That's the closest person I know who has died of COVID. Although I would tell you that yesterday was the highest count since this whole fall drill began. We are not at the end of this. We are not ready. We may individually be ready, but collectively we need to be very much aware of masks and hand washing and six foot social distancing. I want us all to live till the end of this so we can come together without our masks and hold hands and hug each other. But we have to do what we have to do now in order to get there. I am acutely aware of this because of my recent hospitalization and my interaction with um, the uh, doctors who have advised me until there's a vaccine, I'm not going inside anywhere. So we'll work it out. The worship committee, the coordinating council will work it out how to have me there and you, th you there and me here or however we can do that. All of us taking care of ourselves and each one of us taking care of the other. As we come to prayer, I am eternally grateful for the prayers of you and the cards and the notes and the calls that I've received. Let us come to prayer. Great and awesome God, just and righteous beyond all our prejudices, valuing all people without partiality, allow us to sense your presence within and among us, that we may know we are your people. Call us by name, let your favor rest upon us, that we have no need to feel superior or seek fame and fortune over others but may I rather extend your grace to all we meet, imitating Christ and extolling you in all our words and deeds. There are so many things on our hearts and minds this day, O oh Lord. We think of friends and family with whom we interact and we pray that we might be safe with them and for them. We know, O oh Lord, that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there among them whether it's a parking lot or a building, whether it's the front seat of our car or a dining room table, whether it's in our office or in a mall, we know that you are here with us. It is not the building that brings us worship, O oh Lord. It is our hearts. It is our heart beating your heart in all things at all times. We are thankful for all your servant people at this church who are making ready for things and who have made ready for things. We thank you for the opportunity to worship outside and to be able to pray and praise all of what that means to each one of us. You have heard our prayers for friends and family. There are prayers that we carry in our hearts that we cannot even speak aloud. So we lift them from our heart to your heart this day praying not that our will be done, but that your will be done in all things. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. The scripture reading for this morning is Matthew 22, verses 15 through 22. Paying the imperial tax to Caesar. Then the Pharisees went out and laid pans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You are not swayed by others because you know, pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? 
Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. May the Lord open our hearts to the message in his spirit through the Holy Scripture this morning. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This scripture, as I was cogitating it on it this week, because I usually select my scripture early in the week and then I, I chew on it all week. And then I finally spit it out here when I get here. But it was somehow appropriate, and actually it sort of tickled my funny bone. It's sort of a debate scripture. Do you see that with me? That the Pharisees are meeting with Jesus. They invite the Herodians, who are followers of Herod. And they're trying to trap Jesus. Even the first verse of the scripture in verse 15 says, Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. I don't know how many of you have been watching debates and what do they call them? Play, um, town meetings and how many of you have ever been involved in this? Back in the day when my kids were in school, I was a politician. I know, hard to believe. I actually spent six years serving as a member of the Board of Education in Southington, Connecticut. So I did participate in some evening meetings of debate quality, if you will. And when I would walk out my door or answer my phone, sometimes it was a debate that was waiting for me. And sometimes it was just someone who wanted to catch me in the act of being myself. So here's the Pharisees. They're laying plans to trap Jesus. They sent their disciples and they said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. Well, that's a trap right there. We know that you are a man of integrity and you teach the way of God. You aren't swayed by others. And here comes the zinger. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? See, the zinger. Because if Jesus said, no, you don't have to pay Caesar, the gendarmes could be waiting to haul him away because that was an illegal thought, an illegal act, if you will, an act of outright rebellion. But if he said, oh, yes, you have to pay your taxes to Caesar, well, then the people are going to open their eyes very wide and say, what are you talking about? He is an evil person. We don't want to give him any money. And you see, taxes, although we still don't like to pay taxes, let's face it. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts, and, and now it's called Taxachusetts. I haven't lived there for a number of years, but I know every time you go, you have to add a little on for the governor, we used to say, add a little on for the governor. Same thing in Maine when we lived there. I haven't been shopping here too much, so I don't know how much we pay the governor when we shop. But here they are. They're testing. Testing. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, look at the coin. Take that coin out of your pocket and look at it. Whose picture is it? Caesar's picture. Render to Caesar that which is Caesar and to God that which is God's. Hmm. Do you have a coin in your pocket that has God's picture on it? Probably not. But if you carry your Bible, you have God's picture wherever it is. But they wanted to test him. They wanted to know what he was going to say. It was sort of a no-win if you come right down to it. One of those damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of situations. But at the same time, they knew very well what the answer was, as we do. We don't like to pay taxes, 
but we do like to drive on roads that don't have big potholes in them. We do like to look at the highway nice and mowed on the side without you know, creatures coming out at us on the highway. We like to have the snow plowed from the roads that we travel. We like that our schools are available to educate our children. And sometimes we like our garbage to be collected. And sometimes that is paid for by your taxes. So it's a give and take. You have to pay something to Caesar. But what is it and how do you determine what you pay to God? Interesting question. God's picture is not on any of our coins. God's picture is written on our hearts. So when we give to Caesar that which is Caesar and we give to God that which is God's, we have to look inside. Not in your pocket or in your wallet or in your Vera Bradley bag, but inside your heart. What do you give to God? I used to do a children's story, and I used it every year at, at um, stewardship time. I have a friend who's an artist, and I brought the cups that she made me for communion, and, and she made me this children's story. And here's the children's story. I have 10 apples, 10 apples. I always went to the grocery store on Sunday morning, got the best looking apples I could find. So I have 10 apples. So I would say to a couple of the children, you're gonna own the land that I rent. I'm gonna live in the house that you built. So here's three apples to pay for my rent. Oh, now I only have seven apples, okay. And then I'm gonna have to have electricity. So I'm gonna give you three apples so you can put electricity in my house. And maybe you'd give me some running water too. So that's three and three, that's six. Out of 10, that only leaves me four. Oh, and I wanna shop at your boutique and get some clothes, cause you know, I like to dress well. Oh, and, and that would be another. And then, oh, I'm a shoe person. I have to have some shoes. So here's the rest of my apples. And you buy shoes with those. And then I remember, I was supposed to say something for God. So I take back one of the apples that I was going to use for my electricity and my water. But then I realized I haven't really done anything about food. Well, if I just take a bite out of this apple, God won't mind. I take a bite out of my apple. So now I have nine apples that are paying for my room and board, my shopping, my living. And I have one apple that has a big chunk out of it. And I'm really still kind of hungry. So I take another chunk out of my apple. And finally, at the end of the story, all I have is a core. And that's what I give to God, just the core. Think about how you parcel out your finances. I remember teaching our children about finances. I'm not the greatest financial person. Let me just say that right now. My husband has, you know, he keeps me in check. But for the children, we would give them an allowance. But I would give it to them either in pennies or nickels, whatever the allowance was at the time. Maybe a quarter, but it would be divided into two dimes and five pennies. And I would say, now you have to remember, part of that has to go to God. Oh, Mom, how are we going to give money to God? Well, you put it in this envelope, and then when you go to church, you put it in the offering. And the people who take care of the money at church will make sure that this goes to do God's work. And so each week or other week when they would get their allowance, they knew that they had to take a portion of it. We talked about a tenth, one tenth. So if you get 25 cents a week, you have to put two and a half cents away. And you put it in an envelope and you don't spend that money. You don't go back to that envelope and keep borrowing from it, like taking a chunk out of the last apple. Because that's God's. That's what you've determined you're gonna to give to God. 
Does it get the way to God? Do you have something that you have put aside for God? You have seven days in a week, 24 hours in a day. How much of that goes to God? Do you take 15 minutes in the morning to do a meditation or a short prayer? Do you pray before you go to bed 10, 15 minutes and give that to God? Do you serve your community in some way? Homeless shelter. Do you help your neighbors? Do you give something back from what you have received? We are a fortunate people. Oh, we're going to moan and we're going to groan because we have to stay in our house and we can't go out to eat. I'm moaning along with you, believe me. We can't go out to eat. We can't go out to shop. We have to stay in our house with the same old people we've been with since March. Oh, I'm tired of looking at them. But at the same time, look around you. You're sitting in a beautiful car. You don't live in that car. Well, maybe some of you do, but I don't see anyone who's living in a car. You go home and you have a house or an apartment. It's got a roof, walls, a door. I even have a washing machine and a dryer. I have blankets, a galore from quilts that my mother has made. I have clothes. Oh my goodness, do I have clothes. I am, above all people, so blessed. And I hope that when it comes to the end of the week or the beginning of the week, whichever you consider Sunday, that my envelope that I have been paying to God is full as full as the envelope paying my mortgage and my electric and my water and my trash. Render to Caesar that which is Caesar and to God that which is God's. It's a debate. It's a debate. Whenever I talk about giving one-tenth of one's income, I always have people asking me afterwards, do you mean before taxes or after taxes? Do you mean that I actually have to divide my income and give one-tenth to God, to the church? How about if we just call that our nonprofit 10%? Maybe you support public radio or public TV. Maybe you give to support a, a child in need and you give something every month. Or you give something to the Shriners Hospital or, or another hospital that provides care for people for no, par no cost. That can be your one-tenth. That is recognizing your responsibility in this world. The problem is when we get to that one-tenth, we take another bite out of that apple and another bite, another bite, and we look at the envelope at the end of the week Slim pickings. Slim pickings. And some people have found this pandemic a really good excuse not to give to the church. I'm not there. The building is closed. Not a good excuse. The lights still go on in there. The heat still goes on so we don't have frozen pipes. This driveway, this parking lot has to be maintained. We have staff, they like to be paid. I'm one of them, I like to be paid. So there's all kinds of ways that we meet our obligation, and I call it an obligation to God. Because if we are obliged to pay taxes to Caesar, to our Caesar, our governor, our United States, whatever, how much more important is it to be obligated to God? Because we get back from God way more than we get back from the government. Way more. One of the things that I was reading this week about this particular scripture 
This is actually from, um, from the book of Matthew. The Pharisees plot to entrap Jesus. Ah, but they don't face him themselves. They send their dis disciples, I would call them their flunkies, to ask Jesus about paying taxes to Caesar. They don't want to stand in front of Jesus and say, what do we do about our taxes? They want their flunkies to go ask him, no, you go. If you have any siblings, if you grew up with siblings, whenever we wanted to do something, I'm the eldest of four, whenever we wanted to do something, we wanted our mother to give us something or we wanted something, I would make my sister go. She was two years younger than me. She was the sacrificial lamb. Go ask Ma, you go ask her. I don't, I'm not, you go, you go. You want it more than I do. So the taxes that support government. The Pharisees were not happy with Caesar's rule, but most people were content to pay, pay along and play along for profit. There is absolutely no indication that Jesus was interested in overthrowing the government. He didn't ever talk about overthrowing the government. And he wasn't going to get in the middle of their argument about paying taxes to Caesar either. The wisdom of his answer about giving to God what belongs to God, is, that is his wisdom. Why is it that most often only right-wing conservative religious people believe in the mix, the mix of religion and politics. I read a thing on Facebook, I was telling my husband as we were driving here today, there was a little, there's always some little quip thing on Facebook and it said, start talking about politics at the Thanksgiving table, that way you'll cut down your Christmas guest list. We don't discuss politics in our family. Dave and I do, but outside of the two of us, we really don't discuss politics. It's a good, it's a good plan not to discuss politics. Others would do well to hold up to the government, the Christian beliefs, caring for the poor, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, distributive justice. And this author talks about the difference between the illegal sanction and the moral sanction. The legal is what you must do right. The moral is what you should do right. There are moral issues at the heart of Jesus' agenda. The authentic Christian agenda is seldom found in the far right or the far left. And since all, even government belongs to God, let us give to God that which is God's. So we have an imperative to pay taxes. There are people who don't pay taxes. You read about them on the news when they get arrested by the feds. Or when their farm is taken away and they say, why are you taking my farm? I didn't know. The reality is we do have responsibilities. We have responsibilities to our land, to our government. We got our ballots and we voted. It was so exciting. We've been watching TV for a month. They've been telling us how to fill out this ballot. And we said, we'll fill it out, just give it to us. Part of our responsibility, using that ballot. And then we have a responsibility to God as well. When we give $2.50 for a Thanksgiving meal, I can't feed my husband for $2.50 for Thanksgiving, I'll just say that. But thankfully there are people in this world, right in this community, who have found a way to make that work. And all they're asking is a little help. Render to God that which is God and to Caesar that which is Caesar's. It says, you aren't swayed by others. Because you pay no attention to who they are, tell us then, what is your opinion? And Jesus, understanding that they were trying to trip him, said, you hypocrites. Why are you trying to trap me? And so we understand that there are things that are ours. 
There are things that are God's. And there are things that belong to the government. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And verse 22. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. In the Message Bible it says the Pharisees were speechless. They went off shaking their heads. We listen to debates and we're always in favor of one side or the other. And sometimes we walk away shaking our heads and we're speechless. The Pharisees were speechless, but they were speechless because they were trying to trap Jesus and they couldn't. Because Jesus knew the right from the wrong. So this morning, as we end this worship service and begin our worship, which is the work of the people in the world. Remember Jesus' words. Give to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and to God that which is God's. Let us pray. Oh Lord, it's not always easy to be a disciple. It's not always easy to give God what is God's. Sometimes we want a bite out of that tenth apple. Help us to understand that indeed we are trusted to care for that which is put here for our use and for our service. Give us, O oh Lord, the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Amen.